BBC World Service. And now, Omnibus. In today's programme, Andrew Whitehead tells the story of Rudolf Rocker, the man who led the Jewish anarchist movement in London in the early years of this century. First of all, some brief memories of Rudolf Rocker and his outstanding political oratory. I've heard some of the greatest orators of our century, uh, Roosevelt, Churchill. When my dad was in form, I think he was really in a class by himself. Rocker could speak about scientists, about philosophy, about, about uh, everything he could speak. He was a, a marvellous speaker. He could take the most boring subjects and somehow infuse them with life. This was something quite unique about him. I believe we could put it quite simply, he spoke for them and not at them. And I think they responded to this, that he was really concerned about their terrible conditions. In March 1918, Rudolf Rocker was repatriated from Britain back to his native Germany. He'd spent a little more than 20 years in London, and in that time he'd fashioned a thriving anarchist movement out of the hopes and aspirations of the poor Jewish immigrants of the East End of London, the victims of pogroms and oppression in Russia and Poland. Anarchism has always been an elusive philosophy to define. At its heart is a distrust of authority and political power, and an optimism about the ability of men and women to live together without the impedimenta of laws and armies. Anarchism has never found much of an audience among British working people, but among immigrant communities, and particularly the near-destitute Jewish newcomers to Britain's shores, it held great attraction. Rocker's achievement in building up a movement is made the more remarkable by the fact that he was not himself a Jew, but he made a profound impact on those who knew him. William Fishman, who was born and raised in the East End of Jewish immigrant parents, has written the definitive history of Rocker's years in London. He was moved to embark on his research when, 20 years or so ago, he encountered by chance a group of Rocker's devotees still meeting and talking to each other in Yiddish about this anarchist missionary to the Jews. There I saw a small group of charming old people, very articulate. One of them was particularly outstanding, a very beautiful looking octogenarian. I discovered that she was an anarchist. I had heard faintly from my parents about the crazy group, small group, who had led these strikes when he was a young man before the First War, led by a man called Rudolf Rocker. And when I mentioned this name, Rudolf Rocker, to this group, this small band, I could see their eyes light up as though I mentioned the name of a saint, of a, of a god. He was a great man, a really a humanitarian. That's the voice of Wolf Kossoff, one of Rocker's Haverim, or comrades, who died a few years ago. His recollections of Rocker survive in recordings made by David Jacobs of the Museum of the Jewish East End. They used to call him the Anarchist Club. But really they were not anarchists, they were just a group of intellectual people which were trying to give what they had to the people that needed them. So I learned a lot from them, because I, I explained to you I didn't go to much school, and what I did know was more or less what I learned from them. His audience were, in large part, perhaps the main part, a very ill-educated lot. And from the start, he had to um, uh, work as a kind of a pedagogue and there was a didactic quality about all his speeches. The wonder of it was that one was never aware of it. Fermin Rocker, Rudolf's younger son, was just ten when his father was sent back to Germany as the First World War drew to a close. But he has a keen memory of his childhood years in London and of the esteem and affection in which his father was held. He was distinctly uh, my favourite. He was the, the nearest thing to uh, the Almighty himself. First of all, physically, he was a big, uh, powerfully built man, excellent swimmer. He looked the, uh, the image of the 
proverbial German. He was a bookbinder by profession and uh, he had a very light touch. It was a joy as a kid uh, when he bathed me. And uh, if anyone spoiled me, it was he. He never laid hands on me. Whenever I went to bed, no matter what was going on, there might be company or anything, uh, he'd tell me my bedtime story. And um, he knew how to tell stories, just as he knew how to say his piece on, on the platform. There are others who vividly remember Rocker's oratory in the East End. Nellie Dick, or Nellie Plashansky as she was then known, ran an anarchist communist Sunday school in Stepney. She's now in her 90s and lives in Miami in Florida. I spoke to her recently on the phone. The line wasn't good enough for broadcasting, so we'll read you in the course of the programme some of her recollections of anarchism in London. Rudolph was a large, handsome man. He had a moustache and he was very good looking. I'd say he was a man of very simple tastes. I used to go to his lectures. I was quite young then and I didn't understand the language too well, but he had a very powerful voice and everybody seemed to adore him and be thrilled with him when he spoke. Nellie Dick was born in Russia and came to Britain as a baby. Another of Rocker's surviving admirers, Leah Feldman, is also Russian, but her family moved first to Poland and Leah was 15 when she came to London a few months before the outbreak of war. Because on Rocker's lectures he used to come even Orthodox Jewish to hear his lecture. First of all, because he was a marvellous speaker. Secondly, they had, he did a lot for the Jewish people, special for the working people. And uh, so they admired him. It was packed. People couldn't go in. I tell you, even Orthodox Jewish came to his lectures and they admired him. My memory of my father talking about him was whilst he didn't support him politically, my father was a very active Bundist, but he reliked him as a man. Mick Mindell is speaking of his father, Morris, who was a socialist rather than an anarchist. I have a very, very strong uh, impression that my father loved him as a man, respected him as a man, because he felt he was concerned, he was kindly, he would listen to people and would be prepared to discuss political views with people. Uh, he was never dogmatic, that's the impression I get from my father, that he would sit down and talk freely with people. Rocker was able to speak on the same level as his audience because he was himself a working man. Although he developed a formidable intellect and a Catholic knowledge of art and literature, William Fishman explains that Rocker's origins in the Rhineland were modest. Rudolf Rocker was born in Mainz in Germany, 1873. He was orphaned at the age of 13 and he went to an orphanage where his early libertarian instincts were aroused against authority and escaped on many occasions and was brought back and punished. When he quit the orphanage, he became a Nortenstecher, that is, he, uh, training for a bookbinder. Now, the bookbinders are traditionally known for their radical leanings. Rocker quickly became embroiled in left-wing politics and it was this that obliged him to flee from Germany when he was not yet 20. He made for Paris, and there he first came across Jewish radicals and attended meetings of Yiddish-speaking anarchists. Although a Catholic by birth and quite ignorant of the Yiddish language and culture, Rocker was attracted by their tolerant and stimulating political debate. And so when he settled in London in 1895, it was natural that he would gravitate towards the small Jewish anarchist group that met in a pub in Hanbury Street, in a miserably poor district of the East End. Hanbury Street at that time was another long, narrow thoroughfare, very unsalubrious, <laughs> the haunts of many criminals. And here, at the back of the pub, these Jewish anarchists would meet, these troglodytes from the sweatshops, simple, ordinary folk who'd come to educate themselves in radical thought. And he says himself, to get into this back room, it was to push through a group of people who hated foreigners. And the extraordinary thing is, here's this German Catholic virtually thrown amongst a foreign 
strange group who had, through historical experience, uh, become very suspicious of the Gentile, yet he learns Yiddish, which is very easy for a German, and he virtually becomes their guru. It was at these meetings that he got to know Millie Whitkop, a recent Jewish immigrant from Russia. They began living together, and in 1898 they travelled to the United States, where so many Jews were making new homes. But they were denied entry because they refused to marry. Their companionship lasted for almost 60 years. We did not have to go searching for the bluebird of happiness, Rocker once wrote. He was always with us. Anarchists placed great emphasis on equality between the sexes and frowned on the institution of marriage. It took courage for young Jewish women to live in free unions, for nothing was more certain to outrage their orthodox parents. It was only when Millie and Rocker's son, Fermin, was born that the breach with Millie's parents began to heal. Fermin Rocker was brought up in a household of diverse nationalities and languages. I grew up bilingually. At home we always spoke German outside I spoke English. Uh, we were a sort of a minor league of uh, nations. My father was uh, a Gentile, a German. My mother was Russian, Jewish. My half-brother was also Gentile, was a Frenchman. He was born in uh, Paris. He was the only one of the family that spoke uh, flawless English. Uh, my father's English always, he never got rid of his uh, rather pronounced German accent. As a German speaker, Rudolf Rocker had a head start in learning Yiddish, the language Central European Jews brought with them to their new homes. He could uh, write Yiddish. Millie Wittkop, suppose she learned in Yiddish or he learned in another way Yiddish, but, but he couldn't speak Yiddish. He couldn't. He, he thought he speaks Yiddish, but it was a, a broken German. Nevertheless, he made the effort, rare among Gentiles, to learn the Jews' own language, and he could be understood in it. More than that, he eventually mastered the Hebrew script in which Yiddish is written. It was a long process, and when he first began to write for and edit Yiddish anarchist papers, everything had to be translated by friends. He couldn't read his own publications. But under his editorship, the Arbiter Freint, the worker's friend, was read not only in the Jewish communities in Britain, but in Paris and on the other side of the Atlantic in New York. The paper helped to consolidate the influence of both Rocker and the anarchist movement in the East End. And what strengthened it even further was the opening in 1906 of an anarchist club at Jubilee Street in Stepney. It was such a beautiful place, so friendly and quiet. We would just come in and meet people, and we talked and played chess and had discussions, and of course we would have our big meetings there. The club catered above all for the deep yearning of Jews for knowledge and self-improvement. It was part of a tradition which Mick Mindell found still vibrant many years after the club closed. Its influence must have been felt in the future generations in Stepney, because when you look around, when I look around, particularly in the small workshops that I used to go to, um, this love for knowledge still dominated the thinking, not only of the Jewish worker, but his wife. The desire for their children to be educated, to get out of the ghetto. And this really did take place. The club sold no alcohol, but that didn't harm its popularity. It came to be renowned among the anarchist movement worldwide. Nellie Dick used to hold her Sunday school there, and she recalls visits from the greatest anarchist figure of the day, the Russian Peter Kropotkin, who was then living in exile in England. Kropotkin used to come to the club sometimes to lecture, and we'd be dancing and having games, and Kropotkin would come over and join the kids in the games. He had a weak heart, and I was scared he'd have a heart attack jumping around with us. But he enjoyed it, and the Jubilee Street Club was quite a club. Then we had a home, the home in Jubilee Street, and that's where they, were, and they used to print a weekly paper there. The Arbator Fund, workers' friend, and they had a library there. And they had, uh, they used to give lectures there. And there was a circle of intellectual people, and they gave what they had. They gave to us, and uh, so I belong. Used to have dances. The social side was very important. 
As well as the dancers, there were concerts, plays, recitations and sing-songs. In the summer, there was the club outing to Epping Forest, for a picnic and then a lecture by Rocker. The club was open alike to Jews and Gentiles, to Orthodox and Atheist, to anarchists and socialists. When people came from other countries, if they were refugees, the police were always very nice. They'd say to themselves, these men are political refugees, we'll take them over to the Jubilee Street Club, and they'd bring them over. And then we'd take care of them and we'd find some place for them to eat and sleep. This open-door policy had its drawbacks. For while Rocker and his colleagues turned their face against political violence, some émigrés had no such scruples. One group of recent immigrants, led by a man known as Peter the Painter, caused a great deal of trouble to the club. Anybody could come in and listen to the lectures and take part. And this group came into the club and they got involved with two of the girls there. They got these girls to think they were revolutionaries. They wanted me to teach them English. I was teaching English to foreigners in my spare time, but my mother wouldn't let me go over to their room. It turned out they weren't revolutionaries at all, but a bunch of thieves or robbers, and they tried to break into a jeweller's shop. The gang were disturbed during the robbery, and they shot their way out, killing three policemen. One of the gang was badly injured. In his room, police found copies of Rocker's paper, and the popular press jumped at the opportunity to blacken the reputation of the anarchist movement and the Jubilee Street Club. Then, a couple of weeks later, in the first days of 1911, the drama took a new turn. Two of that gang were tracked down to a house 50 yards away from the anarchist club and parallel to it at 100 Sydney Street. I was going to work on the tram and I saw Churchill and the Scots Guards marching up to Sydney Street where these two men were hiding in a house and there was a big shootout. Uh, the local police plus a platoon of the Scots Guards led by Winston Churchill, the Home Secretary, made war on these two social democrats, i.e. Leninists. They were communists, they weren't anarchists. The siege of Sydney Street ended only when the house caught a blaze. Two charred corpses were found in the debris, but there was no sign of Peter the painter, and who exactly he was and how he got away remains a mystery. But for Rocker and the anarchists, the affair had serious consequences. Well, what happened was this, that the, the anarchists were accused of being... Uh, being involved, they were not at all. And these Lettish Social Democrats would use the anarchist club for their own purposes, possibly for conspiring, it could be true, unbeknown to Rocker, who was against this sort of action, because it played into the hands of the Tsarist police, who exploited um, episodes like this to show that Britain that they were they should clear these terrorists out out of Britain completely, that they were a danger to Britain as well as to the Tsar. Club attendance fell dramatically, and outdoor speakers lost their audiences. But the shadow quickly passed. The influence of the anarchists persisted in the many trades unions they'd formed in the sweat at East End trades, and was to blossom with the Taylor strike of 1912. Mick Mindell was a communist in the 1930s, when he was leader of the main trade union among Jewish tailoring workers in the East End. But he happily acknowledges the role of Rocker and his associates in encouraging organisation among the impoverished and exploited Jewish workers. The anarchists had a predominant role. Uh, one's got to look at the history of the time. People coming to a strange country, speaking their own language, hostility around them, and here was a man voicing their fears, their concern, their troubles, their terrible housing conditions, working conditions, and giving them some hope to improve their working conditions. And of course this must have been a tremendous thing. The majority of Jewish uh, Eastern European immigrants were concentrated in the sweated tailoring trades. They worked in these little home-based workshops. They were exploited by their own masters. Terrible conditions, living on the margin all the time. I mean, it's difficult for, you, for people to imagine now working in a what were living rooms, the heat and the stench. In those days, the, the, the irons, the press irons, with the tremendous damp cloths, and the garments were soaked. You suddenly put a hot, a hot iron on a, on a cloth that's been soaked, with the soap on it, it was a hell of a stink. It was Rocker who saw that the only way that they could better their conditions was by trade union organisation. And it was his field workers, 
in the East End that mobilized the Jewish tailors. There was a crisis in 1906 and a strike broke out. But it was in 1912, the second strike, that Rocker led. And it was his charismatic personality, it was his administrative ability, that mobilized thousands of Jews to virtually quit their workshops overnight. Rocker recalled that 8,000 workers in the East End came out on the first day of the strike. Another 5,000 joined them on the second day. And the clothing industry in East London was effectively at a standstill. And for three weeks they held out against the masters. And they won. It didn't break the back of the sweating industry, but it certainly set them in the direction of unionization, which reached its fruition in the 20s and 30s. In the two years between the Great Taylor Strike and the outbreak of the First World War, the anarchist movement prospered as never before. The Jubilee Street Club thrived, the Arbiter Freund sold in thousands, and the standing of the anarchists among Jewish workers was higher than ever. But with the advent of war, all that changed, and changed dramatically. Many anarchists, including Rudolf's companion, Millie Whitkop, were jailed for anti-war activity. The Arbeiter Freint was suppressed. The Jubilee Street Club became a cinema. Rudolf Rocker himself was detained as an enemy alien at an internment camp in North London. My father was the only one who really uh, held his ground against the authorities. I remember the first visit to Alexandra Palace, we, uh, the uh, internees, they were seated on one side of a long table. The visitors were on the other side. There was a board in the, uh, in the running along the center. We could just see the, uh, the heads of the uh, opposite numbers. Rocker protested against the demeaning visiting arrangements and after a tussle with the commander of the camp, he won his point. When we went to Alexandra Palace the next time, the board had disappeared and uh, we were able to mingle and uh, my father had me on his lap, which was uh, heaven. It was in March 1917, while Strocker was interned at Alexandra Palace, that the Russian Revolution first broke out. Rocker later described how every bit of red cloth that the internees could put their hands on was turned into banners and flown from their bedsteads. Many Russian-born anarchists in London prepared to return to their homeland and assist the revolution. Leah Feldman sailed back in May 1917. The day before she embarked, she visited Rocker at the camp. So he was so happy. He said after the war he will come to Russia. He come, but he never came. Because after the war, he learned what goes on in Russia. He didn't want to come. He hopes will be a free society. Will be a free society. The people made the revolution in Russia. Not anarchists, not socialists. By the time Rocker was released, it was already clear that the sort of society which the Bolsheviks were establishing in Russia had little in common with the anarchists' dream. Rocker remained an active anarchist, working and writing for the cause, first in Germany and later in the United States. He died in New York State in 1958 at the age of 85, the last anarchist of world reputation. The movement he'd nurtured in the East End never revived after the First World War. When Leah Feldman eventually returned to Britain in 1928, disillusioned with the way the Soviet Communists had turned against the anarchists, she found a movement in decline. Terrible disappointed for a small group Jewish people, only middle-aged or old, a small group, and the English also, a group, old people, a few I knew from before, and I was very depressed, no young people, only a few old people, and I was so depressed, it was so monotonous, terrible, and I said, England, nah, London is a cemetery, I said. It's something of an irony that in the 30s, those streets in East London, still predominantly Jewish, which had once been home to Rocker supporters, became strongholds of the British Communist Party. William Fishman has described communism as one of three forces which superseded anarchism among the Jewish community. The other strand of anarchism turned towards, towards Zionism, towards the prospect of a national home which had been offered to Jews through the Balfour Declaration of 1917. 
and the uh, a third of course was the with the long years of social suffering and economic deprivation not quite over but much more ameliorated the sons and daughters turned back to their ancient faith to orthodoxy and uh, through orthodoxy to anglicization in which anarchism was a, f a foreign initially a foreign import and certainly alien to their, their English way of life. In a sense then, Rudolf Rocker's achievements were ephemeral, but there's no sentiment of regret in his autobiography. For two decades, Rocker wrote, I gave the best years of my life to this fine and fruitful movement. I lived with Jewish workers, shared their troubles, their struggles, and their dreams for a better future. I gave them all I had to give, and I gave it to them gladly, for there is no greater joy than to see the seed one has planted sprout. Of Rocker's surviving comrades, Nellie Dick certainly shares this pride. We believed in freedom and in liberty. We used to sing a song in the Sunday school which sums up the philosophy of anarchism. It was, no master, high or low. We called it an anarchist communist Sunday school, meaning that we believed in real communism, not what we have in Russia now. And Leah Feldman, now nearing 90, reads the British anarchist journal Freedom, just as she did when she first came to these shores. William Fishman remembers with affection that encounter 20 years ago with the elderly band of Rocker's admirers, which led him to embark on the study of the man he describes as the gentle anarchist. But what drew me to them was their warmth, their giving, the sense of loving, which I, I had not seen for many years, the sense of belonging together as a community, not only as Jews, but a sense of reaching out to people, whatever their nationality, of seeing a world of uh, free from oppression, all, I suppose, these clichés that they use, but really believing in it and still thinking that it would come and knowing it would come in their own terms. Today's edition of Omnibus was compiled and presented by Andrew Whitehead. This Sunday at 16.15, we have a programme about that universal human misery, the common cold.